On the uh, telephone with uh, Mike Pushkin, Delegate Pushkin is the state Democratic Party chair as well. Good morning, Mike. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm, I'm doing okay, considering. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> considering a uh, couple things. Uh, uh, you know, the legislature right now, they're holding interviews wheeling. Really. Uh, however, I am I am not attending. I was planning on attending, but I, I woke up Saturday uh, with COVID, so I'm home quarantining. And um, they, not to bore your uh, your listeners over in the Eastern Panhandle with the Charleston issue, but also we have a major catastrophe going on here in uh, on the west side of Charleston, where I live, where a uh, water main uh, busted and leaked into the gas line and oh, supposedly my. water was pumped through the gas line. So a good portion of the West side of Charleston is without gas. So uh, no heat or hot water. So that's where, uh, where we are right now. That's so. a tough one. You got a frigid morning. So are, are you below freezing in Charleston this morning, Mike? No, it's, it's, it, you know, luckily it's not, it's not, uh, you know, too cold. It does get cold at night though. And we have a lot of seniors in the neighborhood, a lot of children in the neighborhood, uh, who uh, who need uh, need space heaters, need blankets, you know, need other uh, ways to stay warm. And um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it, you know as the uh, the information's getting out there, it's not looking good. We had 27 degrees this morning as our coldest temperature here. So uh, let's talk about yeah. the party. And you took a pretty good body blow there with the decision made by Senator Manchin here. Uh, Mike, were you aware of this decision before he announced it publicly? Um, I, I received a phone call from Senator Manchin on Thursday um, before he made before he made it public. Not long before he made it public, and we had a good conversation. And he said that you know he's been in, in public office for 41 years, will be 42 when he finishes his term, and uh, that he was ready to uh, to spend time with the grandkids. That's what he told me. Obviously, he left the path open for doing something other than spending time with the grandkids, though, Mike. Well, I can only relate to you. What he, what he told me is he was he was looking forward to spending time with the grandkids. Now, I, I would if you're referring to the uh, you know rumors about uh, whether or not he would a third party run for president. I, I I know Senator Manchin, and I know that he's been around politics long enough to know there's no clear path to victory uh, for a, a third party. Uh, candidate for president. If you look at American history, there, there, there never has been. Uh, with, with, there aren't the electoral votes, especially when you have winner-take-all elections in, in the vast majority of the states. I think all but maybe two or three, uh, there is no path to victory for a third-party uh, presidential candidate. Um, I mean, it didn't even work for Teddy Roosevelt, and uh, he's on Mount Rushmore. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah uh, Bill Stubblefield, uh, uh, Mike, good to talk with you. Uh, and But I would argue, and I have argued in the past, uh, that these are unusual times. We have two major candidates as unpopular as what they are. But to counter that, we have two, perhaps three, of people that are already declared to run independent. That independent uh, platform is going to get awful crowded, or it is off crowded right now. Well, I, it, it, I still don't see any of them uh, getting a, a majority of votes in, in any states, and especially not enough states to win uh, enough electoral votes to uh, to be elected president. I think the worst case scenario would be that um, if Senator Manchin were to uh, run an independent race, that uh, he would play the spoiler. And in most cases, when there's a third party candidate, uh, the most they can do is play the spoiler. If you look at, at Ross Perot in um, in '92, was one of the most well-funded third-party candidates we've ever had. One of the most successful third-party candidates we've ever had. I still don't think he got what 15 percent of the vote, and 19. but it was enough to yeah. take votes away. 19 percent. Yeah, 19. He took enough votes away from George H. W. Bush that he was able to help elect uh, Bill Clinton. And he played the spoiler. I think you could see the same possibly with Senator Manchin taking votes from from President Biden and helping to elect Donald Trump, somebody that Senator Manchin has referred to as the greatest threat to our democracy. So I don't think that that's what he wants to do. Was that, I think as the numbers are shown to him that that's what would likely happen. I don't think he's going to do that. Was that part of your conversation with him, Mike? 
Uh, no, he said he wanted to spend. Uh, he said that he's been in public office for a long time. He was ready to take some time off to spend time with his grandchildren. So that that didn't come up. Let me ask a technical question. This came up in our discussion uh, last Friday on the show about what happens if no one achieves 270 votes. It goes to the House of Representatives, but then what happens there? I, I believe it's the, the new newly elected House. But does, does the House vote the way it is, as constituted, or does it proportion by, by states? Um, if, if nobody gets the, uh, the required yeah. number yeah. of electoral yeah. votes, I, I would have to look that up. I mean, when's, uh, has, when's the last time that's happened? I don't think it has happened that I know of, yeah. but there is it, there this time goes back to the second point we made a second ago uh, with the unpopularity of the two two major candidates it's going to be for the first time the probability or possibility of, of, of nobody getting 270 and again I'm really confused I've spent quite a bit of time weekend trying to explore this but I've not come up with a good answer of what happens when it goes to the House of Representatives yeah I, I don't think that that's likely to happen and it never has happened um, and uh, you know the election is uh, a little under a year away. <clears throat> That's a long time in politics, and I think when it becomes more of a, of a binary choice, uh, you'll see people uh, really coming behind uh, one of the two major party candidates. That's really what happens every time, and uh, you'll have to see a lot of people uh, voting against the person they think is the worst choice, and uh, people voting for the person they think is the best choice. And if you look at the uh, the legislation that was passed during the, just the first two years of the Biden administration, whether it was the uh, American Rescue Plan, uh, whether it's the infrastructure bill, uh, the bills that were passed uh, to, to help veterans across this country, and most recently the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, while uh, it gets some bad publicity in West Virginia, it, it's really uh, you know, not deserved because uh, the, of the amount, the unprecedented amount of, of, of of investment that you're seeing in West Virginia due to that piece of legislation, uh, I, I think that once we're able to tell our story and it becomes a, a like I said, a two-way choice, uh, I, I believe that the president will be reelected. Hey, Mike, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. I hope you're feeling better. Um, the, Slightly. <laughs> it's, it, when I got COVID, it just wiped me out. It, it's like you, you take your head off the pillow and it's time to go back to sleep. Um, yeah, I'm over that part of it. I mean, I'm out of bed, uh, but uh, you know, not having heat uh, is, is <laughs> definitely not helping matters. I bet. And I'm not trying to get sympathy. Don't take it easy on me. But anyway, oh, okay. But... All right. <laughs> um, obviously, these are kind of troubled times for the Democratic Party in um, in West Virginia. I want to talk to you about the, the route you see for regaining a foothold, and let me pose it in the form of a question. With the growth of the Freedom Part, uh, the Freedom Caucus within the Republican Party, and there's a sense that th there's pressure to move the Republicans farther and farther to the right. Is that your opportunity to capture moderate Republicans and turning them over to putting uh, to the Democrat Party? Yeah, that's a good point. I think the Republican Party across the country has really moved further and further to the right. And you know we're often uh, mischaracterized and, and and wrongly defined as being out of step, out of touch. That we're too 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 extreme, and it's really quite the opposite is true. Especially here in West Virginia, or at least in in your state legislature, the Democrats tend to be the adults in the room, where you have you know Republicans fighting over whether or not to uh, uh, to you know, to. to Put the money in the fund that would that would attract businesses here, like 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 Form Energy up in the, in the northern Panhandle, or they fought against the, at Newcore in the eastern. I'm sorry, in the um, in Mason County. <laughs> so we often, you know, we're often the adults in the room, just fighting for what most people uh, would think is is sound policy. Now we haven't done a, a good enough job of, of 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 getting that story out there, but I think that what you're seeing in in, okay, four out of the five uh, border states uh, to West Virginia had elections uh, last Tuesday, and they all turned out uh, very well for Democrats. I think that was in response, especially in Virginia and Ohio, that was a response to the Republican Party moving too far out of step with where most people are. 
in, in Ohio, especially in regards to abortion. And in West Virginia, we have a complete uh, statewide ban. And no matter where people fall on the issue, I think most people feel that it's uh, a bit extreme to have an all-out ban in this state. So – there, and there's a whole host of issues where Republicans have just become more out of step with the, with the with the vast majority of, of voters. And I think, uh, well, we're seeing that in other states. I think West Virginia will come, will come along as well. Mike, shortly after Senator Manchin said he would not run for re-election, uh, uh, Shrewsbury, who I do not know, uh, has declared that he would be running. Can you tell us something about this gentleman? Um, yeah, he's a uh, he's a, a Marine veteran uh, and has served this country. He he actually filed uh, he pre-filed uh, bef- well before Senator Manchin has made his announcement. So he was he was planning on on running in a primary uh, against Senator Manchin. I think now that Senator Manchin has made his announcement, uh, there are other people who are who have made inquiries, and there is a lot of people who probably weren't planning on getting involved until they knew what Senator Manchin's intentions were. Now that he's made his intentions known, I think you know we're looking at a primary on our side, and we'll let the primary voters decide who the, the best person will be uh, to keep that Senate seat in the Democratic column. And we believe we can keep that seat in the Democratic column. We feel that the, the candidates on the Republican side are incredibly flawed. Uh, we have a governor who, uh, during my I, in my entire tenure in the legislature, it's been, I'm sorry, my uh, I've served under Governor Justice's entire tenure uh, as governor. I've been in the legislature that long, and he doesn't show up for work, and and it shows when you have every single uh, department of state government that is in crisis right now, whether it was the DHHR that the legislature had to split up due to the uh, just the toxic culture over there whether it's corrections, where we've been under a state of emergency, having to call in the National Guard uh, to, to um, staff our prisons. And they get, recently, the state had to pay ta- you know, our tax dollars off in a settlement uh, with uh, you know, inmates, families of inmates at the, from the Southern Regional Jail. <laughs> and that's just the first one of those lawsuits to happen. Or, or whether it's uh, the Department of Transportation, we have engineers weaving in groves because of the culture of corruption at the Department of Transportation. Um, I could go on and on and on. Every aspect of state government right now is failing under this lack of leadership from Jim Justice. And then his, the other uh, Republican in the race is uh, uh, Alex Mooney from over in your neck of the woods. I mean, he's been in the legisl- he's been in the in Congress as long as I've been in the legislature. I can't point to a single legislative accomplishment. Uh, that the guy could hang his hat on. So I think the Republicans have very flawed candidates. I think that we're going to have a robust primary on our side, and we're going to come up with the best candidate who can keep that that seat in the Democrat in the Democratic column. Bill, uh, just to let everybody knows Zachary Shrews. <laughs> you're right there, Mike. I, I'm, I'm hanging in there. All I, right, I can do it. You can hang in there. Yeah. Uh, Zachary Shrewsbury is his full name, and he's 32 years old. Grew up in Jackson, Monroe counties. Lives in Fayette now. Served five years in the U.S. Marine Corps in the Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team, FAST. And he'll be our guest tomorrow morning on the program at 8.35. What is he doing now? Do you have any idea, Rob? We'll find out tomorrow at 8.35. Okay. I'll, I'll listen. Thank you. <laughs> what he's doing now is he's running for Senate. He's running for Senate and on the show tomorrow at 8.35. <laughs> Uh, Mike, let's let's talk about uh, a, a couple of different things. Uh, otherwise, with uh, state politics here, and I want to go in toward this upcoming, uh, this interim that's going on right now, and then the upcoming legislative session too. What are some of the main things they're trying to accomplish during these interim sessions this week in Wheeling? Well, I think uh, generally when we go on the road, it's more informative. Uh, there are less uh, real oversight hearings as there are. Uh, you know, uh, different uh, folks coming in to present on, on issues that will be taken up during the session. Uh, I watched part of it. Uh, unfortunately, I said I can't be there, but I watched part of it yesterday on the live stream. And it was basically going over, uh, you know, how some of the bills that would have passed, how they worked, how they have, and what could be improved, just like a normal uh, interims, except they're on the road and they'll, you know, take in all the sites of wheeling and, and, uh, and, um, and enjoy that. Now, I'll tell you one thing, after what's going on right here in Charleston during the next session, I would like – I'm saying something I'm surprised is not in statute already. I feel that uh, utilities uh, should be required to communicate with their ratepayers 
uh, when a utility is going to be uh, uh, cut off. Uh, they're, they will, they're not required they now? It's a failure. To, I guess not because they just cut off the uh, most of the west side and there was not a bit of communication for Mountaineer Gas. That's interesting. So th th this is this is in regards to a, to a late payment. This is because of a disaster. No, the type you're having regard, right no, now. They'll yeah. let you know when it's a late payment. Yeah. They have okay. a way to communicate <laughs> with you then. No, this is in regards to a, an accident that happened. Either way, people are still without gas, and there was no communication from the gas company on this. I would like there also to be some type of bill that says when Internet is down or cable is out, they cannot charge you for the time you're subscribing to their services when they're not providing a service. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I think that the legislature really needs to step up and protect rate payers from some of these out of control utilities right now. So every time they go before the Public Service Commission and ask for a rate increase, uh, they get it. Uh, we seem to have a revolving door between the industry and the regulators when it comes to the Public Service Commission. I think people are getting uh, pretty fed up with that. People are every every uh, every year they see their their uh, their rates go up and their and the service go down. And uh, and this is just uh, you know another issue that we're having down here. But I would like to see something in statute that really requires them to at least, at the very least, communicate with the people who are, are paying their bills, and let them know when something like this is, is occurring. Mike, do you know how the accident happened? Because that means two per, two lines, a gas line and a water line, had to be broached at the same time or in close proximity. Yeah, there was a a, an, a, a house. I don't think anyone was living in the house that uh, had caught on fire. I think there was a small explosion that, that caused the water main to break and somehow almost like it's broke into the, uh, the gas line as well. I said, I don't, you know, nobody really knows everything because we're not receiving any kind of communication from either the water, either from West Virginia American Water or Mountaineer Gas. West Virginia American Water, I believe, just uh, moved into the Eastern Panhandle with a purchase in Jefferson County there. Well, good luck. Uh, I've always been a firm believer that in public water systems like we used to have uh, everywhere. I think when uh, the, uh, uh, you're providing something as essential as water, you should answer only to the rate payers and not the shareholders. That's how I feel about it. When you have the money, especially with a company like that, where they're uh, more concerned about um, uh, sending profits elsewhere and less concerned about putting those profits back into the infrastructure. You have like things like this happen all too often. Mike, in the upcoming legislative session, there are a lot of folks who will be lame ducks who are in leadership. You've got uh, several people on the Board of Public Works that are running for a different office. The governor's obviously running uh, for Senate. And my question to you is, do you feel like that will be a distraction and affect the upcoming legislation or uh, legislature? Or is this uh, no different than the House of Delegates, which has to run for reelection constantly anyway because you're on a two-year term? Well, I think in election year sessions, there, there's always a big difference. And um, you see, uh, unfortunately, less and less real work get done and uh, more of the bills that are introduced and, and put before us that are mainly for political purposes. I, I hope I'm wrong about that, but that's how it usually is in election years. And I think now this year we have several members of the legislature, both in the House and the Senate, that are seeking higher office. It could be uh, even, even worse in that regard. So we will be on the lookout for it, and we'll call it out when we see it. When we see somebody who's really putting their own uh, political ambition ahead of the work that really needs to get done for the people of West Virginia, we plan on letting people know about it. Mike, you've faced a, uh, a challenging uh, problem uh, with the, uh, the dominance of the Republican Party. Uh, we've asked before, how do you uh, hope to make inroads? Are the candidates that you see on the horizon, uh, would there be more moderate candidates or more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, severe, extreme, progressive candidates? Well, well we want candidates who are willing to work. We want candidates who are willing to listen to their constituents. I think that's what's more important to me than ideology is are, are they willing to listen to their constituents? Now, if that's the case, then they, they're going to be the perfect candidate for that particular district. Uh, or in some districts, they might want people to have uh, to carry this view, and in another district, it might be uh, something different. We want candidates who reflect their district. And, uh, and we are getting uh, lots of phone calls, lots of inquiries, a lot of people who are interested. A lot of conversations are happening with candidates for, for, for every office right now, whether it's statewide, legislative, or even down to the county or, or municipal level. We are building calls, and we plan on putting together a, a great slate of candidates to really reflect 
the values of, of, of everyday West Virginians. And I think you're seeing uh, the mood in the country definitely change, where the Republicans have become far more ex- far too extreme, and, and they're the ones that are really out of step uh, with the with the voters in the middle. And uh, you know, West Virginia might be a little bit late to the party, but we're going to get to the party. And uh, I, I, you know, it, maybe not this cycle, but uh, here uh, we're going to fight for this cycle. But um, um, I think what you're going to see is a change throughout this country, where people are going to are going to come to their senses and start voting for the the party that actually wants to get work done, and, and not the party that simply wants to uh, put out uh, these you know meaningless cultural war. Uh, type issues that really don't have a whole lot of effect on the day-to-day lives of people. One minute left, Bill. Okay, uh, I'm a pushback a little bit. Uh, every year at this time, we hear uh, someone from the Democratic Party in West Virginia say we're going to have a very vibrant, a very aggressive list of candidates. Yet, the majority of the uh, uh, the pl- uh, majority of the races, there's no Democrats on the ballot. What's going to be different this year? Thirty seconds, Mike. <laughs> Well, we have, a, we have a plan, and we've been working with our county committees and working with people in different communities and and, uh, and actually focused on, on a lot of down-ballot races. I think in the past, unfortunately, a lot of the focus was put at the top of the ticket. We're focusing on, on every single race. Now, yeah, it's much harder to recruit candidates when you're in uh, the minority, even harder when you're in a super minority. But I know that there are folks out there who are just as fed up as I am with the way the Republicans have mismanaged this state. And we're, we continue to be last in everything. We got people leaving this state in droves. And I think there are a lot of people who want to step up and do something about it. And if you're one of those people, contact your local county committee, your local Democratic executive committee. Contact uh, the state uh, the state party. Mike, I got to get out of here because I got a hard break at the top of the hour, man. And Thanks run for your time. for office. We will be behind you 100% of the way. <laughs> run for office. That's what I was Thank you, Tell Mike. Have a good day, hey, buddy. Thank you.